Good afternoon. My name is Laura and welcome to the Writer Position Fix-It Show, where we discuss writing position topics and share ideas and exercises to help you and your writers. We are pleased to welcome with us this afternoon, Susan Harris. Hi, Susan. How are you doing today? Hi, fine. Nice to be here. Excellent. Where are you coming in from today? Cortland, New York. Excellent. Susan Harris is a renowned horse person, artist, riding instructor, and international clinician who conducts center riding clinics in anatomy in emotion, anatomy in motion. <laughs> Let's try that again. Mm -hmm. Anatomy in motion demonstrations. She's the author and illustrator of Horse Gates, Balance and Movement, Horsemanship in Pictures, Grooming to Win, and the U.S. Pony Club Manuals of Horsemanship. Susan apprenticed with Sally Swift, the founder of Centered Riding. She teaches clinics in Centered Riding, Anatomy in Motion, and Equine and Rider Biomechanics. Thank you for joining us here today, Susan. Well, thank you for having me. It's nice to be here. Oh, we're so excited to have you here. This is just such a treat for us to be able to have somebody of your level to isolate all the things you're doing at the jumping position. Co-hosting you know, with me today to is Ren. To jumping instructor. You what? What did you say, Susan? Oh, I'm sorry. It's nice to talk with other jumping instructors. <laughs> it is, isn't it? It is. Randy has been coaching and certifying riding instructors for over 25 years, and she's a horse industry legal consultant, mm -hmm. an expert witness, and the founder of Jumping Instructors Network. Also today, we have Jay Duke. Hi, Jay. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me on the show, ladies. You're welcome. Ooh. Where are you coming in from? Coming in from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Excellent. Yeah. Jay is a former Canadian equestrian team, I guess that's Equestrian Canada team member and Equestrian Canada senior course designer and host of the Jay Duke show Monday evenings on the Jumping Instructors Network. And me, I'm Laura Kelland May, Equestrian Canada senior judge, hunter, jumper, equitation and hack, senior steward and competition coach specialist. Thank you, everybody, for coming and visiting us today. And if you're watching live, thank you for joining us. And if you're not watching live, you're watching the replay, thank you so much for spending your time with us. Yes, and while you're here, whether you're watching the live show or watching the replay, we want to know about more about you. Tell us where you're coming from in the comments in this area. You can also like and mm -hmm. share the show directly to your page by sharing it from the post on our Facebook page, Jumping Instructors Network. Excellent. So you want to get started right away? Yes, what, yes, yes. <laughs> our first topic, well, we're going to be talking about two specific topics today. The first topic is developing that independent seat. We've got lots of uh, photos and images and exercises that you can do to help develop your independent seat. And our second topic is uh, the uh, crest releases and automatic releases, different types of releases and how you can establish and develop your releases. If you have any questions, please put them in the comments and ask because I know Susan, you will li like to take questions. Happy to. Excellent. And uh, if you have any questions for any of us, I guess we are here to help you out. And if you okay. know somebody who should be here watching, please share this video with them, right? Okay, so we're going to get started here with the, the mm -hmm. uh, independent seat. We've got some nice images that we're going to share. So I'm just getting things queued up here. Okay. That's not the right picture. There we go. Hello. Ah, there we are. There we go. Well, there is, there is the late, great Bill Steinkraus. And when we're talking about an independent seat, um, we don't mean a seat that flies into the air and is independent from the horse. We mean a seat that is so secure that your hands are independent from your body. And you can do any kind of relief you want to. You could jump with your hands out to your sides or hands on your head because you're so secure. And if you look at Bill's position, he was the great master of style. And he didn't do it to be pretty. He did it because it really worked for him especially. 
Oh. Yeah, so how, how um, what vintage is this photograph, you think? Uh, this was built on Sinjon, so I'm guessing this is probably 60s, 70s, 60s probably. Uh, and, this... and I don't know if it was when he won the King George V Cup over in England or not, but uh, Sinjon was a fairly difficult off-track thoroughbred, and he and Bill really clicked. Yeah, so uh, the moral of that story, too, is that if you have an independent balanced seat, it's not going to it's not going to go out of style or be obsolete. Well, I think the uh, style changes, but I think the, the fundamentals, what works, doesn't really change that much. Uh, and the, the only reason for me, for position, is to make it work. So if you look at Bill's position, he has, uh, if you extend his stirrups, his stirrup leather, which is vertical, by the way, straight up, it would cut his body roughly in half. His hips are behind the, the stirrup, his shoulders are ahead, his heel is down, his calf is on, his lower leg is clearly on the horse, and knowing that this was a pretty hot hyper thoroughbred, he's not clamped on like a, an iron band, but he's absolutely secure. Mm -hmm. And that allows him to do anything he wants to with his arms and have a very, very, we're going to talk about releases later, but it allows him to keep contact through the air without ever having to grab the rein or put too much pressure on the rein or use the reins for balance in any way, which is the cardinal sin. So uh, independent seat means the seat is independent of the hands. So the hands can do whatever they need to do. It kind of looks so like you could take this person off of this horse and put him on any horse, really. Well, absolutely. And, you know, if the horse disappeared, he'd land on his feet. Right. The other thing we should notice is his eyes are about as good as eyes get, looking ahead. Yeah. So um, he was a great master of style, but he wasn't doing it to look pretty. He was doing it because, for him, it was functional. And I think that's the way we should be teaching students as instructors. Uh, and then if they start jumping, uh, this was Kathy Kuzner back in, again, in the 60s, um, I believe setting the ladies high jump record in Aachen, Germany, the horse is Aberale and that fence is seven feet too. And when I think of great jumping, this is one of the pictures that pops into my mind's eye because she is absolutely in the middle of the horse, utterly secure. Uh, her angles look a little exaggerated because this photo was taken from below and you couldn't very well take it from any other angle than below, could you? Uh, so you notice that it shows a little more of the bottom of her foot and the bottom of her chest, and it's not going to look exactly the same well, as if you were looking from you know, dead seven from the feet side. Here, right? Yeah, but how many people can be that um, secure over seven feet too and look at the release she's getting? And again, she couldn't do that if she didn't have the absolutely secure and independent seat to from which she can reach as far forward as she wants to or needs to and absolutely not interfering with the horse in any way over a record high wall yeah if you take a close look the reins look like they're like there is contact but there's no interference absolutely this is we're going to talk about releases later but this is a great example of what we call a following hand following the horse's head through the air and you absolutely can't do it unless your seat is so correct, so secure, that you can't, you don't have to catch your balance by tightening up on the horse, on the reins. All the securities in your balance, your leg, your calf, your heel, your upper body. Here's Frank Chapeau, similar era. Uh, that fence, by the way, would be an illegal fence these days. It was... Uh, Swedish oxer, and we don't jump those anymore. But I think Frank looks like he's turning across this oxer on Good Twist, who is the daddy of Gem Twist. And again, can you think of a rider looking more secure than that? And he was known for turning and burning. And, 
Oh, absolutely. And if you can zoom in a little closer yep. on that, yep. you can see, oh, well, we've got Beezy, and she's about as good as they get, too. So mm -hmm. you can zoom in a little closer on that. You can, again, look at the position. He's absolutely balanced over his leg. His hips have gone backward, not forward. Uh, his leg is on the horse. Body is right where you want it to be. Eyes are looking where he's going, and that allows him to do whatever he needs to for direction and control without ever grabbing the horse in the mouth. And that saddle. Let's go on, take it, a look uh, at the next it, one. It, it, it looks like it's quite yeah. flat. Uh, that was in the era where everybody right. rode predonations or uh, right. air mates, if you could get them. And they had, you know, there's a couple of Nothing. slips of leather between you and the horse and not much else. Right. All right. And here is BZ Madden, a little more contemporary one. And again, look at the security. If you can zoom in on her leg, her leg is, uh, to me, about as good as legs get. Heel is down. Calf is out. Or calf is on the horse. Uh, notice that her stirrup is angled slightly the way they've been telling us to do in equitation. And the reason they tell us to do this in equitation is because it puts more stirrup tread under your, your foot than if your stirrup went absolutely straight across. And it facilitates getting your calf on the horse. Uh, and her leg is absolutely under her, absolutely secure. If she wanted to put her hands out in the air like an airplane, she could do that. And of course she doesn't, she's following, this is judgment I think, and she is following his jump and his head and over yep, a judgment. jumper sized fence, making it look easy. So again, we have great security. Um, this is Laura Kraut. And looks to me like Laura's making a turn in the air. Can we zoom in any closer on that yep. one? Yes. I think I sent you a small picture. Um, you can see her eyes have turned, and I think she's turning in the air. And again, Kathy's on. Yeah, you can on, see her eyes. Down. Yep. Hand is coming off to the side, and her balance is absolutely with the horse. If the horse disappeared, she'd land on her feet. But she's part of the horse, and I think that's what we're looking for for independent seat, that you are so part of the horse that you are absolutely confident. There's no looseness, no bouncing, no flying in the air, and you're not gripping for your life with one part of your body while other parts and that around. takes a lot of time so people understand whether you're teaching or trying to learn it yourself. You don't achieve an independent seat like this in a year's time. It takes time. Oh, no. It can take uh, your whole career. The whole and, career. That's exactly right. But we're going to start. We're going to talk uh, about the process and how you develop it as much as you can. Um, there's no place you need a more independent seat than in eventing. And this is Mike Plum on Bluestone. This was in the 1984 Olympics. And would you say you'd need an independent seat over that size fence? Mm -hmm. Remembering it's a solid fence with a downhill landing? Wow. <laughs> you know? So if you look at Mike, you will see he is, it was sort of a characteristic of his style that he would round up his back in the air. He'd kind of go into uh, what racing ski racers call the egg position, but his leg is absolutely as solid as they come. His balance is totally with the horse. And does he look like he is going to survive the landing? Yes. I'll bet. And again, absolutely independent. Now, he does have his hands up on the horse's neck. And if I were going to jump, uh, hopefully not anything quite that big, but something with a big spread with a downhill landing, uh, I'd follow his example. Right. Okay. <laughs> now, the first thing we're going to say about this one, this is Alicia Bert or Burton, who is a famous girl from New Zealand, is this is done by a trained professional. Please do not attempt this at home. <laughs> but you can't get a whole lot more independent seat than 
no hands, no reins, no bridle, no stirrups, no saddle. And that's a pretty sizable fence. And if you zoom in as close as you can on her, you will notice yeah. that her position is about as good as if she were riding with a saddle. Her legs on the horse, her toe is up, her heel is down, her calf is on the horse's ribs. She's in balance. And if that isn't an independent seat, I don't know what is. But please, if you insist on trying this at home, do it over a ground pole or a cross rail. Don't start with the size bench she's doing. <laughs> and in fact, we are not recommending this at all. Absolutely. Okay. Now, here's the process. And as an instructor, I've got, I like to have a process of developing the seat. One thing we have to keep in mind as instructors is that a lot of riders that we teach today are not as athletic as you could wish them to be. So they may have to develop fitness and develop strength as they go. If you're blessed with a really strong athletic rider, great, they can move along faster. But sometimes we're not. So the first thing that I like to do is actually the middle one. If you can zoom in on the middle guy, uh, this is work on, uh, there we go. This is working with two point and working on doing two point with no hands. Uh, if you have somebody who rides maybe once a week, they can't be as fit as someone who's riding every day or riding several horses every day. So one thing you might do is ask them to do what we call four and four. That means posting four up downs, riding two point for four beats, posting four, two point four, keep that going around the ring. The posting keeps the horse in rhythm. The two point for four beats means the rider is getting a lot of two point practice, but they're not doing it for long, long, long periods. So if you have somebody who is just starting, four and four is a good exercise. Uh, as they get better, they should be able, perhaps on the lunge line, to take their hands off the main or the neck strap and begin posting no reins, no hands, both posting trot and two point. And you have to go with the fitness and the confidence of the rider you're teaching. This is not something I would ask the 65-year-old lady beginner to do. But if I've got a 14-year-old athletic kid, I would like to get them to the point where it's reasonable to ask them to ride two point with no stirrups. Now notice it's important that the setters in the right place, the heels are down, calf is on the horse, and that they find the right upper body angle for their horse and their balance that day. This could be a little more forward than this rider shows or a little more upright. Uh, and they need to be securing their leg with the calf of the leg, not by pinching their knees. If they pinch their knees, yes, they will be secure at the knee, but everything above the knee and below the knee will pivot. Uh, the leg will swing back and forth, and we don't have as secure a seat. So the time to really find the security in your leg is when you are still working on perfecting your posting trot and perfecting your two-point position. And if you can do it uh, in two-point, you should be able to wiggle your knees to test it. If you can't wiggle your knees in and out, you're gripping with your knee, and chances are really good that you are slightly out of balance, and that's why you're gripping. So if you can ride no hands, and you can breathe while you're doing it, and you can do this longer and longer and longer, all the muscles that support you in that position are gonna gradually get stronger, you get fitter and more athletic, and you're getting ready. <laughs> if you're an inventor, you're getting ready to go cross country. Um, Here's the, if you go to the left picture, that's the next stage. And that is learning to ride without stirrups, learning to post without stirrups. And you absolutely want to have the rider have a neck strap when they're doing this to protect the horse's mouth. Because I don't want the rider, if they make mistakes, and it's only human to make mistakes, 
I don't want those mistakes to go all the way to the horse's mouth and catch him on the bit. So the rider needs a neck strap. And we have two ways of riding without stirrups. The classic method that you use in dressage is sitting up very tall and straight, letting your leg drop down, and that's to give you a deeper seat. But for jumping and posting without stirrups, you have to secure your leg in a jumping position. That means your knees come up. They don't drop way down like in a dressage seat. And your toes must come up and your calf comes on the horse. Keeping your toes up stretches your calf and keeps your calf firm. If you let your toes drop, your calf flops like a pillow and it will drop you right down onto the seat. So the rider has to learn how to pull the toes up, have the knee in the right place, and get that calf secure on the horse's side. Uh, and that's a strength exercise because you can hold it about so long and then your muscles say, that's it, I'm done. And the fitter you get, the longer you can hold it. So, uh, Susan, that, just excuse, pardon me for interrupting for a minute. We I do have a comment or question from uh, Christine Scott. So she uh, wants to know any examples over lower fences. It's difficult for students working around point 90 to transmit the mechanics that are really obvious over larger fences to the smaller ones. A student of mine has been asking, and I haven't found any yet. Um. So I it's think it's I the have same later on a smaller okay. uh, photo over a smaller fence. Okay. But the thing I would tell the student is same position that Bill Steinkraus is doing over a big fence is exactly what you want to do over a cross rail. Yeah. Well, exactly. Your horse so will tell you, if you how much you have to fold. If your horse makes a little hop, he won't fold your body as much. If your horse comes into a cross rail and says, Hey, look, mom, I can jump this big. You may go, whoa, but he will fold your body a lot more. And you have to have your legs secure on his side, your hip joints oiled up smooth so that your horse can fold you, your eyes up, and be breathing. And the horse will, the size of the jump the horse makes will determine how much you fold. You don't try to guess, well, let's see, this fence is about this high, so I should fold that much. You let the horse tell you. So the mechanics really are the same, whether you're jumping a meter or if you're jumping five feet. Yep. Or whether you're jumping six inches. Right. And uh, to help this rider with the mechanics of that. So like a two point, uh, that's what, exactly what we're going over now. This system that, exactly. that you do need to do. Point. So two, do point, the two point without point hands, the four up, four down. Right up the two point where you can wiggle your knees a little. That doesn't mean you ride with your knees off the horse. But if you're going to give up anything, have a little contact above the knee at the very bottom of your thigh and contact on your calf. And if anything has to be sacrificed, it's probably the knees. Because if you go tight knees and you let your calves come off the horse, you're going to pivot. So find the spot where your calves are on the horse. You're sinking into your ankles and you feel super secure. And I'd like and to, I could add something here, Susan. Can you hear me? Is the sure. value of that neck strap. That neck strap has made such a difference in what I've been doing with riders because, as you were saying, mm -hmm. it gives them security where they're not leaning on the horse's mouth. If they use it right, mm -hmm. it can actually help them sink into the saddle because they'll, with the neck strap, they'll feel it pinching their fingers. And that's a sign that their seat has slid to the back of the saddle mm -hmm. instead of being centered over their lower legs. So thank you for sharing the neck strap because I feel this is such a valuable tool for any discipline of riding, whether you're doing the jumper ring or dressage, it'll help develop your rider's independent seat and hands in ways that it's hard Absolutely. to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. you. One thing you'll notice is on that picture with the, of, uh, uh, Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go, ahead, Jay. Go ahead, Jay. Are you familiar with the CWD hands-free system? I've seen it, yes. Uh, yeah, interesting. That, so it, it basically is an advanced neck strap. So you have you have yeah. a neck a strap, it, it hooks to the saddle and goes over the neck. And then each hand holds um, a, bun, a short bungee cord. So there's an elasticity mm -hmm. in it. And it shows mm -hmm. you where to put the hand. Um, so instead of having to grab the neck strap, now you can actually hold your reins as normal 
but it, it keeps the hand in the correct position at all times, but there's flexibility to it because of the bungee. Um, it's, it's quite a, it's something that never really took off and I don't know why, because, uh, I thought every instructor mm -hmm. would love to use it. it. It really, instead of having to tell your rider where to put their hands, it, it just does it all for you. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think it gives a rider muscle memory. Of course. So that once you have felt it, you've got it. And we have another comment here, Andrea. Thank you, Andrea, for sending this in. I'm a certain age. My trainer has me doing this at times. I'm working on my canter and half seat pushing into my heels. Will you be covering riding in the half seat? Yes. Uh, for okay. our purposes today, I'm going to say half seat and two point are going to be just about the same. Uh, there is what the Germans call a light seat, which means that you are in the forward position, but the front of your seat bones are lightly touching the seat of the saddle. And, and that's call, often really useful in jumping. They call that a light seat. Light seat. Yep. And that's very useful because from it, you can easily fold into a uh, half seat or two point position and you can also sit up more. Uh, so the real important thing is whether you are riding with your short enough stirrup to be suspended above the saddle as you would be for big jumps mm -hmm. or whether you're riding with a little longer stirrup and you are close to the saddle. The real important thing is that you are secure in your legs and you're not falling back into the saddle or thumping the saddle. Uh, and also that your stirrups are short enough that you can clear the saddle when you get up over the fence when you need to. Susan, can you Can't explain, jump right on the, can you explain the, the differences between the half seat and the two point? That's That seems to be a big point of confusion for a lot of people. That seems to be, uh, I, I think some people use the term half seat to describe what the Germans would call a light seat, which means that in both of them, you could have the exactly the same body angle where you are closed at the hip, you are basically riding forward, your leg is under your body. And some people use half seat interchangeably with light seat, meaning that you are touching the seat of the saddle lightly with your seat bones. And uh, the Germans tend to use half seat, meaning what we would call a two-point position where your seat is actually off the saddle and you know, there's a little air between your seat and the saddle. And in North America, we often use two-point. Uh, George Morris popularized this term way back. So two-point means the two points that are touching the horse are your left leg and your right leg, and your third point, the seat, is off the saddle. Uh, when we're talking about the light seat, which is often used interchangeably with half seat. Uh, you could say that is a three-point seat, but it's a very light three-point seat. And I think over most jumps, certainly over big jumps, you would like to be in a two-point seat. You would like all your weight down in your leg and your seat suspended over the saddle, but it shouldn't be way up ahead of the saddle. Let's go forward and look at a couple of uh, things okay. because I notice we're getting close to uh, the halfway mark. Um, we were talking about having people learn the, um, I just want to finish up with the uh, without stirrups work. Keep in mind without stirrups work, that would be the one on the one with the neck strap on the left. You've got to go back one. <laughs> there the one. Uh, keep in mind that without stirrups work, you have to have the secure leg. You also have to find the upper body angle where the horse posts you. If you're trying to lift yourself up with your thigh muscles, you will give out very quickly. And if you do that in posting the trot without stirrups, you'll do it when you jump and you'll find yourself standing up. So good posting is training yourself to jump correctly. It means you have to find the angle where the horse does the lifting, find the angle where the horse folds you. And this is a strength exercise, so you have to build up to it gradually. Uh, if you're really fit and you're riding every day, and maybe you're even riding more than one horse a day, you may be able to do an entire ride, no stirrups at all, walk, trot, canter, jump, everything. That would be ideal, especially if you're headed for big fences. But if you ride a couple of times a week, it's going to take a lot more work and it'll be gradual. 
Let's move on, take one look at the last one, uh, the third position. And this is no hands, no stirrups. And you've got to have the other two working for you before you do this one. This would be like uh, Alicia Bur Burton on the Pinto horse, mm -hmm. only this rider has a saddle and hopefully isn't jumping quite such a huge jump to start with. So it's really important that you have learned your leg position and balance with stirrups, and you have developed the security and the strength without stirrups, and then you can jump no hands. And it's really good to do this over gymnastics. It helps you get the rhythm. You absolutely cannot stand up ahead of the horse without stirrups, or you will learn really quickly. It doesn't work. And this one is for riders who are really fit and pretty bold. Hey, you found me. <laughs> All right, let's go forward and look at another picture or two. See what we've got. Oh, this is my students way back in the day when we had black and white pictures. And they are jumping. In this one, they are jumping no stirrups, I think. You have to look really closely. Uh, you notice that the girl on the first horse who is doing the airplane exercise, no, they do have stirrups. So they are practicing with stirrups, no hands in the chute, and she has stood up a little more than is advisable. And the jump isn't very big. She does have stirrups, and if necessary, she can grab the nail or the neck strap. But this will teach you very soon to fold, not to stand up ahead of the horse or try to guess where the horse is going to be. You have to let him tell you. Let's go on to the next one. Oh, here's more, the praying mantis. <laughs> this is what happens if you stand up. And riders who stand up, notice that she's opened her knee instead of closed her knee. Lower leg has gone back and slipped out of position, even though her heel is still down. And she is supporting herself on her arms. And if her horse disappeared, she'd land on her elbows. So unfortunately, we see a lot of people try to do this because their instructor has said, stand up, get up off that horse's back. And I find and most, you find that literally. Most, Susan, do you find that most riders as they're learning the riding position <clears throat> tend to do this until they get balanced where they're sinking over their lower legs? Well, this can come from stirrups too long for jumping. And it can also can come from standing up instead of finding a really good, correct, secure jumping position. I would sure hate to see, oh, any of our big jumpers. How about Mike, St Mike Plum on that eventer? Would you like to see him coming over that big spread with the downhill landing in this position? Oh my God, <laughs> cover your eyes, right? So this so is what's, Can you explain what this blue dot is here? The blue dot represents your center of balance or center of gravity. And in this rider, it has gone forward and up, which is where we don't want it. So let's look at the next one. Okay. And this is a rider sinking instead of standing. And I think this is something that I have to teach a lot of riders who have learned to stand up and get ahead of their horse and gotten scared because they get ahead. I'm talking about um, novice, intermediate riders, not people who are successful advanced riders. Uh, when you sink, you first you start out with a correct jumping position and you sink just a little. You let your hips sink back, your heels sink down, your knees fold, they don't open up and your calves even sink into the horse's side. And it's nothing to do with getting left behind or hitting the horse in the back or thumping the saddle. It's sinking closer to your saddle and it makes you feel more secure. It also makes you more secure, but it's the opposite of opening your knee and standing way up and getting right out over the horse's neck where you're vulnerable. Okay, so you we'll can teach to... riders to sink a little bit. I... And you can do this if you are practicing two-point in the trot or two-point in the canter. Think about sinking but not bumping. It's not like getting left behind. And if you, I'm just thinking if, if you could overlay the, what do you call the praying mantis over this one? So the previous yeah. one, 
over this, which is, I mean, you can see that their yeah. person's bellies mm -hmm. button is right over the withers and pommel. Yep. Some people will actually get their whole seat ahead of the pommel. Oh, yes. I've and seen here that. you're sinking over the middle of the saddle. And again, that vertical stirrup leather is just about cutting the rider's seat, your rider's body in half. In half, yep. So just uh, it's mean, a sign of good balance and security. Now, are people going to sometimes violate that? Of course. If you jump a really big fence with a huge thrust, hey, um, your leg could slip. Yep. But if you have practiced this over smaller fences and you've really worked with your two-point with stirrups, posting and jumping without stirrups, and eventually jumping no stirrups, no reins, you're going to have the security that if your leg slips, it won't slip that badly and you'll still be there, we hope. All right, let's go look at the next one because okay. that one's relevant too. This is the idea of folding rather than standing up and folding over an imaginary seat belt. Now, I expect the next thing we are going to see is saddles that come out with a seat belt attached, right? Ooh. <laughs> oh, but you have to do put this in your imagination. Uh, and if you imagine that you have a seat belt, that's going to help keep your seat back over the saddle instead of standing up ahead of the saddle. And I think that makes a huge difference in your security. So let's go forward and see what we've got with the next one, or we can... <laughs> Okay, I like the comment from Yes, Linda so Allen. this uh, thank you so much Linda for uh putting this comment in. I love this. Over the jump, especially small jumps, the rider shouldn't do more than what they do posting. It should come just as natural as a posting trot. I love to do many transition from posting trot. I'd love to do many transition from posting to light seat to half seat and back, focusing on the transition. That is not throwing the upper body forward, going into the lighter seat and not falling back into the saddle, coming down, but sinking instead. That is the whole key, isn't it? Sinking. I'm glad you used that word. Thank you, Linda, for putting that comment there. Thank you. And nice to hear that from Linda Allen. <laughs> okay. Uh, here is an exercise you can do on the ground. Uh, We've got the skeleton here. This could be Peggy Brown, who's my partner in anatomy and motion in her skeleton suit. And if you have your riders stand on the ground, maybe put their toes on a two by four, or actually the ball of their foot on a two by four, that gives you the heels down feeling. And for little kids, it might have to be a little bit less than a two by four, just a little piece of wood. But it helps you get the feeling that you are solid and secure. Then you just find the balance where it's easy to balance over your feet. If you were standing up, you better hope there's something in front of you or you're going to go sprawling on your hands and knees. And if your leg got out ahead of you, you would fall down on your backside. So if you find that position and then find your springs, and if you look at closely at that diagram, you'll see that we put springs at the ankles and the knees and the hips and the elbows and the shoulders. Riders should have springs. And boy, you need your springs when you're jumping, especially on landing. But this gives you the feeling of finding your balance with springs. And we'd like to put that into your muscle memory. The other thing I really like is I'll have my students hop down off the bottom step of a mounting block and land on their feet. And think about how you feel and what you feel in your body as you land on your feet. Not the top step, the bottom step. <laughs> And as you land on your feet, you can feel your springs. And I don't want them to, you know, maybe twist an ankle or something. So I don't ask them to do it wrong. But I will ask them to think about what would happen if you jumped off the mounting block and you tripped and you landed on your toes. You'd go sprawling. What would happen if your legs got out ahead of you? You would land on your backside. Don't do that because I don't want you to sprain an ankle. Susan, but you land on up, your feet. Susan, you brought up such an um, uh, an important point. Whether they're riding on the flat or over fences, if a rider, you know, it's that learning the muscle memory. They've got to learn how to keep their riding position springy from their hips, their ankles, and their knees. Right? If there's no spring, they sprung right out of the saddle. Yep. Right. 
we've been talking a lot about position. Thank you for bringing up muscle memory. And I, we've been talking a lot about position. We don't want a writer to become perfect position in what I call a cookie cutter writer who looks like they were stamped out by a cookie cutter and baked in the oven too long. And if they fell on the floor, they'd shatter. I want to see a springy rider. And once in a while, a rider who actually has springs, maybe their heel will slip a little bit. Maybe their knee will slip a little bit. But if they have practiced good balance and they are flexible, they're going to be able to cope. One last thing about getting that uh, really independent seat is you can work over fences when you're ready for it. You can also work on the lunge line when you're not quite ready to be jumping, no reins, no stirrups. Um, and start with stirrups, start with a neck strap. And the work on the lunge line or the work no hands over fences gives you many little challenges to your muscles and especially to your neural pathways. It teaches the body to cope. It teaches your body to react fast and automatically. Now, I don't want to make it uh, do or die. So you have to make sure those challenges are small enough challenges that the rider can be successful and they don't get scared. Because as soon as you get scared, you tighten up and you no longer can learn what you need to learn. Your body can't learn when you're scared. But these riders, you can see by the grin on her face, even though she's standing up a little too high, she's not scared. She's going, this is fun. Oops. And the oops is all right as long as it's still fun. As soon as it becomes terrifying, the instructor's pushing <laughs> the student too far. But this is challenging her reflexes, her muscles, and her um, the neural pathways that go that teach you muscle memory and you want to make sure that that challenge is gradually increased within what your student can handle so it's kind of like that uh link between from starting from being a mechanical thing to actually feeling and understanding what the horse is doing underneath you so you can move mm -hmm. with the horse and a lot of this is going to bypass your conscious brain you want to get so good that if your horse took off early, you might say, oh, my God, but your body yeah. will automatically yeah. reflexively react. I think a lot of jumping is reflexive. So we have to train the reflexes, but we have to do it at the level where the rider's reflexes can learn and kick in. And putting a rider into terrified survival mode <laughs> might make him survive, but it isn't no. going to teach him much. It doesn't. And that's not good for your insurance either. No, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So we are, uh, we're getting on again, Susan, we got a little off track there, but now, so is there any comments or questions about the, um, the independent seat? We had some really good questions and comments mm -hmm. and we're going to go on to the releases now, but if okay. you do have comments or questions, we will, We'll, oh, look, it looks like somebody just put a comment in there. Uh, okay, here we go. What does she say? Okay, I'm going to show this one. I'm going to show it. There we go. I tried it with my students to use the mounting block to feel their joints. It benefits them in their jumping a lot. Yes, it does. Oh, great. And it's so, such them, a simple thing, yeah. isn't it? Tell them to think as they're going to the jump, land on my feet. And if they've landed from the mounting block, their body will know what they mean. Yes, it's kind of like golfing. If you want to hit a ball straight, you kind of have to say, okay, I'm going to hit the ball straight. And your body kind of corrects itself one, to make one sure. One question on that one, Susan. Um, because what some riders will do is then they'll, they'll tend to push their feet too far in front of them um, when, they're, when they're riding, which opens up their hip position and then that drops their shoulder. How do you... How do you help that? Because there are several riders that will literally kick the le the lower leg forward, and there's several professional riders that do this too, especially in the hunter ring. How do you how um, do you help them with that? I think the lower leg forward uh, it can be a defensive seat. If you ride big jumps, eventing, jump downhill, uh, or you ride a horse that might throw a buck at you or a big spook. You have to be able to get your leg out ahead of you because if your leg gets behind you, you're coming off. 
But if you ride with your defensive seat all the time, you are going to have to grab with your muscles to keep yourself from falling back onto the back of your seat. You're working too hard. So my cure for that would be to get up into two point, no hands, wiggle your knees, sink your heel, secure your calf, and see if you can find the place where you can ride no hands without having to grip. If you have to grip, you're fighting your balance. Now, if you don't have to grip, your your legs will have to be underneath you. And I think there are times when a rider is going to get their leg displaced. But our stirrups are, stirrups are on a pivot. Stirrup leathers are attached to the bar, and the whole thing will pivot forward. And many of us use the um, hinge stirrups and the bottom, the uh, stirrup tread will pivot a little bit too. And it's very easy to get the, get it started that your heel first pivots a little in front and your leg goes ahead and you're maybe driving your heel so far down that you're actually driving it forward and out ahead of you instead of um, underneath you. So I think the real cure for that is two point with no hands and two point making sure that you're not covering up an incorrect leg ahead position by grabbing with your muscles. Great. And then once in a while it'll happen. Let's, uh, let's take a look at the releases um, that we're going to discuss yeah, today. That's, that, uh, that's a big topic as far as people not pulling on their horse in the, in the air. So let's, uh, let's get oh, to the release yes. section. So let's take a look at our release pictures. There we go. All right. This is uh, Jim Cohn from way back. And if we'll, let's go in as close as we can on his position. There will be a limit to how close we can go. Um, we used this the other day when we were talking about position. And we did say that he is a little farther down close to his horse's neck than perhaps you would, would be ideal for equitation. But to me, that's about as secure a jumping seat as you can get. And the horse has jumped up into him. Notice that horse is giving that fence a lot of air. So if the horse jumps up into you, <laughs> to me, that's the perfect way to handle it. And one of the things I really love about this picture is that he is so secure. He's able to ride with straight line from elbow to bit. Uh, he may be taking a little support from the neck, but with the shadow under his hand, I think he's not taking much, if any. And that straight line from elbow to bit means that the bit is not nipping the horse backwards or up in the mouth. And look at the way the horse is using his head and neck and front end. He's absolutely not being interfered with, even though the rider has contact. So this is a good, to me, it's a good picture to kind of carry in your mind of where we'd like to be able to go. Let's take a look at the next one. This is... Uh, Esther Sims, and he is, I really like this picture because he has, his upper body is in beautiful balance with the horse. I, again, I don't think eyes get a whole lot better than this, and he is jumping with a really soft, light release, and yet with contact, and again, the horse is using his head and neck and front end really confidently, and again, we could run that stirrup straight up, and it would cut his body in half. So nice picture. So here's the uh, phases of the jump on takeoff as the horse shifts from, as the horse fires on takeoff and leaves the ground. He begins to drop his head, fold up his knees, and the rider needs to allow that stretch. As he's over the, the middle of the fence, the rider needs to stay off his back centered so that you're not interfering with the horse's use of his back and allow him to stretch. And then as he lands, the rider needs to land on your feet, but stay independent so that you don't grab the horse in the mouth and interfere with the very delicate phase of landing and recovery and finding the stride away from the fence. The better you land, the better you can move on to the next fence. And you can see that the rider's hands and arms, in this case, are able to follow everything the horse does. Let's move on, take a look at the next and one. The other thing in that illustration, and all these illustrations mm -hmm. I want people to really notice, is that the elbow to the hand to the bit is always a straight line. That's that's yes. uh, 
the i mean there's a lot of angles on the body that are important that's the most important angle on the body i and absolutely every, agree with you every uh, illustration that, here you'll see that line and it's it's yeah very deliberate and really focus on that for all your riders yeah and that allows the bit to act neutrally if you raise if you raise it up it takes the bit up in the stretchy corners of the horse's mouth mm -hmm. and that is not as severe as red dropping it down but it's not ideal either. It's better than, uh, you know, it, it's less harmful than too far down. But if you drop your hand down below the mouth, then it tends to crack a snaffle bit right over the bars. And that can really inhibit the horse's use of his head and neck. So it's, if you have to go up to the crest of the neck, that's okay. But allow your horse to use his neck. And straight line elbow to bit is ideal. That's what we should carry in our minds and be looking for. Let's go to the next one. I'm just keeping track of the time. Okay, here we have four progressive releases. Excuse me. Excuse me. Bless you. Oh, gesundheit. All right. Uh, let's go to the one before that has... The, oh, oh, we got it. That's right. There's the first one. And this is the primary release, and this is for beginners. And we always say grab mane. Grabbing mane is also the emergency release when the air is full of rails and trouble because at least it keeps you out of the horse's mouth. The thing you have to remember is grabbing mane is not to keep a rider on when their balance is terrible because it won't always do that. It's to protect the horse's mouth. So we have to teach grabbing mane correctly. If somebody grabbed mane back toward the saddle, the horse would stretch his neck out and hit the reins anyway. Mm -hmm. And if they grab mane up toward the ears, it will teach the rider to stand up and lie down on the horse's neck. So you want the rider to put their hands about roughly a third of the way up the neck. And it might depend a little bit on the relative size of the horse and the rider and the length of their arms. But roughly a third of the way from the saddle to the ears. Anchor the hands side by side on the crest and with the fingers pinch the roots of the mane and also press your hands forward and down into the mane. So even though you're grabbing mane, you're not pulling back. You're pressing down into the mane so that you're anchoring your hands on the mane. And notice this horse has a little slack in the rein so that even if the beginner made a mistake, he has a little bit of a safety factor. Now let's go to the next one. And this is, if you are doing if you're learning the primary release correctly, you're also learning a long crest release. So let's zoom in on our long crest release on the chestnut horse here. And notice the rider's hands are in the same place as when grabbing mane or the primary release. But in this case, horse has a braided mane. <laughs> Some people put that special braid or the right color so that the kid knows where to place their hands. And you could pinch a braid, but then you're grabbing mane. In this case, you Velcro your knuckles to the neck. Now, it's really important when you do a crest release, you put your hands in the right place. But also, you should have really firm forearms. If you have sloppy, floppy arms and wrists, that lets you lie down on the neck. And the people who hate the crest release all say, oh, the rider just falls on the horse's neck. Well, that's when they're not doing the crest release right. You have to have firm arms and press hard like you are pushing the horse's neck away from you. And that does two things. It pushes your hips back. Remember we have showed that sinking picture? So if you press forward against the crest as though you could shove your horse's neck away from you, that is going to help you get your hips back. It also trains your hands and arms to follow the movement of the horse's neck. And by Velcroing your hands to the neck and anchoring them, you have a lot less chance that your hands are going to fly up and nip the horse in the mouth right when it would be the worst possible time. So let's look at the next one. That'll be the lower left. And this is a short release. And a short release, you notice this rider has her elbows bent more than the previous rider. So the short release is closer to the saddle. And a short release is more appropriate when, for instance, you need really good control on landing. Maybe you're going to have to make a turn on landing 
<laughs> when I was fox hunting with Limestone Creek, we had one particular coop that you jumped into a lane and immediately as you on landing, you had to make a 90 degree right turn in a grassy lane downhill. Boy, you needed a short release on that jump because if you had a great big long sloppy release, you better hope your horse knew where he was going or you were gonna be in the bushes. So the short release gives you more control and it's not a good choice over a big oxer, but a rider who is working on crest releases should be able to use a correct short release, again, with pressure forward into the neck, not running your hands up and down the neck like a jockey riding a finish, but pressing forward as if you could push the horse's neck away and the short release is just put a little closer to the saddle. So you have a little more control on landing. Let's look at the one that has two releases. Uh, we'll come to the uh, jumping out of hand in just a minute. Uh, we've got a Okay, we had that one already. Yeah. Now, let's look at the rider on the gray horse, because this is the auto release or automatic release, and this is an advanced release. I think of the um, primary release as for beginners and emergencies. Crest release is intermediate, and it was never intended to be the end result or the be-all and end-all, so it's an intermediate step. And the auto release is advanced. Notice that rider has a straight line from elbow to bit, mm -hmm. but her hands are taking a little support from the neck. You can see the shadow under the hands. And she has practiced enough pressing forward that she will follow the horse's head, even though her hands are taking support from the neck. So this would be an advanced step from the short release to straight line from elbow to bit, jumping on contact and following the horse. And some very good riders do this when they need a little extra support, especially over a gigantic fence. Uh, let's, if we can go back to our, I'm gonna wait on this one, this is the last one. So let's go back to our, there we go. This is the following hand. And this is definitely an advanced release. Notice that riders, got the straight line from elbow to bit. Her hand is completely off the neck and she is following the horse on contact all the way. If you're going to do a following hand, or even if you're going to do an auto release, number one, you need to be fit. If you, even if you know how to do it, if you haven't jumped in three months, this is not a good place to practice the following hand. You need to be fit riding every day, jumping ev just about every day, and in practice. And the problem is that if you make a mistake, it's your poor horse's mouth that pays for the mistake. And then you ride on contact into the jump, and as the horse takes off, he draws your arms forward. And you don't change the contact. It never gets tighter. It never gets stronger. And it certainly doesn't drop him and then it comes back, stays the same throughout the jump. Let's quick take a look at the last one, which is the um, driving hold. The driving hold is a wonderful way to learn the following hand. And if you can zoom in as close as you can safely zoom, notice that you hold the reins the way people hold the reins when they're driving a buggy. They come in over your top finger with your thumb and go out the back of your hand. And this really makes the rider's elbows follow. And it's a great way to learn to follow the horse's head with a straight line from the elbow to the bit. And this is something that if you are jumping with an auto release, you could practice this, but do it over small fences and want to be careful when you're doing it. That's a great way to learn. Now, could we go and look at the video we've got? This is uh, Jay's course. daughter jumping a fairly substantial um, combina um, gymnastic using a following hand with a driving hold. And I think we got one minute, so we're gonna get, we're gonna fit this in. <laughs> All right, so. 
She is using the driving hold. Can you see it? Yeah. And yeah, let's go ahead and watch her, watch her follow. Beautiful piece of writing, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Soft. And if we have time to watch it again, go ahead and watch the whole thing. And you see her elbows follow the horse. And that's one beautiful thing the driving hold does for us. Uh, Jay, you were saying you jumped Grand Prix fences using the driving hold. Yeah, I had a, a 16 three-hand thoroughbred that named King David, who is a, uh, actually Yousef Horse of the Year in the, in the jumpers and the amateurs in his later stage. I stages remember of King David. And uh, he was a very sensitive horse, went a rubber snaffle, uh, no martingale. <laughs> And uh, he he loved the driving rein because you really just couldn't. All you had to do with that horse was teach him the course. And but if you got in his way, it was oh. you were in trouble. Oh, it gives you beautiful sensitive hands. And I don't think we have the picture. Maybe we do, and I don't know it. But I understand even Ludger Bierbaum uh, jumped uh, with a driving hold in Grand Prix. Yeah, Ludger, so, um, Olympian gold medalist. Uh, an amazing rider and he used the driving ring quite often on the the sensitive ones the sensitive mares typically is where he would uh, yeah. switch the driving ring and Krasinski yeah. was also a very big proponent of the driving ring and top top right. american equestrian so it's a good way to learn this um when you're when you're ready when you're fit and you've done your homework driving hold is a wonderful way to go that's right it is do you have any further comments or questions my we gosh it's 201 we Actually, Laura, do you want to go over some of the questions and comments? Yeah, I'll do that. I just want to get this showing here. Can you see that maybe a little bit? Oh, we've got Ludger Beerbaum. Absolutely. So. Can we zoom in on it as close as we reasonably can? No, it's not acting properly. <laughs> no. That's all right. It'll do the Aachen. In the 90s. Yeah, at Aachen. Yeah, at Aachen. And um, yeah, for Can you see that? those of you who have not seen Luger ride live or on TV, um, dig up some videos. Yeah. He is an absolute master and a wizard of the sport. Um, oh, an absolutely. Brilliant horseman and a wonderful guy. Ratina Z, who is a super sensitive mare and incredible talented horse. Yeah. Look at very, very those fingers. Yeah. Yeah. So just uh, quickly here, uh, thank you for these videos. April says, thank you for these videos and learning so much. Been implementing your advice while riding. Since I don't currently have a trainer, I'm recording my rides and looking for my problem areas. With your mm -hmm. guys' tips, it's really been working in my horse benefit. Thanks again. It's much appreciated. Thank you so much, April. Tonya. Tanya says, I'm an older rider trying to return to my love of jumping. When I do two point on board on the ground, I can't hold the position securely without putting my arms straight out at my sides without reins. Why? I'm guessing she might be a little <clears throat> bit behind the leg. Try bending a little more forward at the hips and experiment until you find a spot where you say, oh, that's more secure. But it might be more forward than you think it is. I don't mean forward. I mean more closely folded than you think it is. Patricia says, thank you. Thank you. Great job. You're welcome, Patricia. Tanya again says, I've got a green 15-year-old Irish sport horse, Mary. I'm greenish, 53-year-old mom. I don't want to hurt my horse. Should I just stick to dressage? Well, that's I to think you can jump, but I think you have to do it systematically. And the most important thing is you need a good, sensible jumping instructor to bring you along and make sure you get the foundation right. You can do what I call pre-jumping exercises, two-point on the flat, uh, two-point over ground poles and cavaletti. When you get to be the queen of cavaletti, you won't hurt your horse when you go to cross rails. No. And if you get really good over cross rails, you won't be hurting your horse, but you have to build the foundation. Nicole says this was fantastic. Love watching your videos. Well, you're welcome. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, Kim, thank you very much. You're welcome, Kim. Linda yeah. Allen says, Routine went in a snaffle in Hackamore when he first got her. Later, she went plain snaffle. Most riders go to more bridle as they have them longer, not less. Interesting. Oh. Yes. 
It sounds like he did it with more sensitive hands, and and look where she went. Most right he went with her. Good for beer bomb. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But we can we can learn from him. You bet. Okay, so thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Randy, who do you have on your show on Friday? Well, this Friday, we're not sure what we're going to do, but we're thinking it would be a lot of fun. I know we make it up sometimes as we grow because we have so many amazing stars like Susan mm -hmm. who join with our show. But we're thinking of doing a show just for the hosts. We'll meet the hosts and find out more about them, and we'll be asking each other's questions. And then on, let's see. Uh, whoop, I've got the wrong sticky tab up here. I'm using sticky tabs. How about you, Jay? Well, Randy's figuring that out. Who's your um, guest on Monday night? Massio Rivetti, two-time Olympian. He's competed internationally for Brazil. He's competed mm -hmm. internationally for the Ukraine team. Uh, he's had a top 12 finish at the Olympics, competed at WAG. Uh, really a great, great character, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. And that's Monday night, 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. Eastern. and 7.30 p.m. Eastern on uh, the Jumping Instructors Network. All right, and Robert mm -hmm. Blanchett will be with us the next following Friday, and he's a Grand Prix jumping and dressage rider. He's a Nations Cup team member and coach, oh. and he's going to be sharing his training, exercises, and advice with us here on the Jumping Instructors Network. Excellent. Thank you so much, Randy. And again, thank you very much, Susan, for being our guest host today and sharing these wonderful images, artwork, and uh, tips and exercises that we can do to improve our riding. Thank you so very much. What's your if, next show, Laura? Oh, my next show, again, it's on Wednesday, Wednesday at 1 p.m. We have oh. Meredith Gallagher coming in to talk about positions, riding position, and jumping. Again, so thank you so much, and we'll see you next week or Friday for 1 p.m. on Jumping Instructors Network. Thanks now. Bye. Bye, Thanks everybody. Bye. We'll We'll see you on the other side of the fan. There you go. Bye okay. now. Bye-bye.